Are you ready? Okay. Wait. give thanks for this precious choir. Thank you. Women's choir. Women's choir. Yes. Thank you. A small group of men together. Okay. Or a large group of men. Okay. The word is out. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to everyone to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome to everyone. We begin our service this morning as we do each Sunday by welcoming all that you bring with you to this space, all of your, to this space, to this world, really. Everywhere you go, we want you to feel that you're at least wholly welcomed by one community here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where we embrace you fully, your beliefs, your background, your experiences, your differences, your lifestyle, all welcome here. So welcome to one and all. That includes everyone in the room with us, those who are used to hearing me say this each Sunday, as well as those who might be hearing it for the first time today, you're equally as welcome. And it also includes the many of you who are streaming with us today. We're always glad to know that you are here. So thanks to one and all. By the way, if you are streaming with us, we want to begin very shortly uh, having a Zoom room that some of you can join to stream the service together, if that makes sense. And then afterwards you can chat or talk, and we'll also have a screen in our uh, fellowship area so that we can even talk back and forth with some of the in-person folks uh, as well as those who are Zooming. But we need, we're going to need a, a few hosts to put on our list so that there can be folks that can sort of host and share the screen on Sunday, so I won't get any more technical or complicated than that. But if you're if you're streaming, and you want to uh, volunteer to be one of our hosts, please uh, text me if you can, or shoot me an email, whatever works for you, so we can uh, make this happen as soon as possible. But for now, it's just always great to have you with us, and we want to be able to interact with you as much as possible too. So. What else is going on today? Let's see. Let's see. What's going on? Is it a special day today? I can't remember. <laughs> you can't? Alex, I don't know. Alex and I are scratching our heads. Well, and let's just move on. Maybe it'll come to us later. <laughs> no? <laughs> He's giving you a hard time, Mom. No dessert for that kid. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Yes. Thank you, thank you. That means a lot. Yes, uh, it, is, it is Mother's Day, and uh, it is a day that 
we have come to actually use to honor mothers, the mothers in our lives, right? And there can be a lot of folks that help mother us through our lives, whether they're our biological moms or not. So it's always a, a special time to remember them and the importance in our lives, the importance of some who are no longer in our lives. But also I think it, it is an important day to remember that the origins of, of Mother's Day was really from mothers who were tired of losing their children to unnecessary warfare. That's how the holiday started. We're at a time now in our world where there is a terrible war going on where mothers are losing their children again unnecessarily. So I think it's particularly uh, important for us to, not only while being grateful for the mothers in our lives, acknowledging uh, the point of Mother's Day, and that what, what, what so many of these loving mothers did by reaching into their pain and their anxiety to organize in a way to reach out to the world and say, no more, no more. This is, this is not how we should be handling our problems and our differences. So thanks to them for their courage. And we shouldn't forget that. I also briefly want to want to touch upon uh, the sort of big news of the week, the, the troubling news of the week for for most people who consider themselves progressives or, or liberals, and that is the the surprise uh, Supreme Court decision, the impending Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. By, by way of encouragement, I, you know, I, I can only offer the Stoic philosophy, which is we must be at our best in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. There are some things we can control and some things we cannot control, and we should worry about the things we can control, not the things we can't. So we must be who we are and stand for what we stand for and try to regain lost ground and gain new, new ground as we live out our values. And that is what we will do here. I could say so much more. I'm not going to. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. I know, it's, I know it's tough. I know it's tough for a lot of us. It's scary. It's sad. And it makes us angry. So we'll acknowledge those emotions and welcome them here today. And this is part of why we come together. Because we can accomplish so much more together than we can alone. And we can accomplish so much more as individuals when we know we are not alone. And so you're not alone here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane. So please take a few moments now to greet one another. Say hi to those you know and love. Make some new friends today. If you're joining us for the first time or more recently, please don't be shy. We're glad you're here.
Thank you. And as always, there will be more opportunity to visit during our social hour, so please do stay around for that. Let's move forward now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. If we wish to know about a person, we ask, what is his story? What is her real inmost story? For each of us is a biography, a story. Each of us is a singular narrative which is constructed continually, unconsciously, by, through, and in us. Through our perceptions, our feelings, our thoughts, our actions and, not least, our discourse, our spoken narrations. Bio biologically, physiologically, we are not so different from each other. Historically, as narratives, we are each of us unique. Oliver Sacks. Well, I want to start by saying that this behind me is indeed a women's choir by design. It is not because our men went missing today. <laughs> and I hope to put together a small men's group for Father's Day. If you're interested, talk to me. Okay, with that out of the way, we are going to sing number 1026, If Every Woman in the World, please rise as you're willing and able.
Those are beautiful sentiments, and I think that's what most people in the world think. We share it. We share that desire. So. We're now going to kindle our candles for those who are most on our hearts and minds, our candles of care. And uh, we are going to begin with a candle for the people of Ukraine, people of Russia, people of Poland and other parts of the world that are being most impacted by what's going on there. Uh, we're kindling a candle this morning for church members Phil and Barbara Rodriguez. Phil is dealing with pancreatic cancer. Please keep them in your thoughts at this difficult time. And a candle of celebration for our church member Owen Murr, who was a member of the recent honor flight to see the war memorials in Washington, D.C. You can congratulate Owen when you see him again and ask him about his trip. I'm guessing he'll be happy to tell you all about it. <laughs> Knowing Owen. Let's take a moment of silence now on behalf of others that you might be thinking of. And as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. And we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain our community and our mission to the larger world. I'd like to invite all children to come forward for a story. Come on down. Good to see you all. Right. 
right, so on this Mother's Day, I want to tell you about an important conversation that Theodore Parker had with his mother when he was five years old. Raise your hand if you're five. I thought we had a five-year-old. How exciting. And some of you have already been five. Raise your hand if you've already been five. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> so his story takes place a long time ago before the Civil War. Young Theodore was walking in the fields of his farm one day, absent-mindedly swinging a stick through the tall grasses. It was summertime, and a gentle breeze cut through the warmth of the shining sun. He stopped to watch the water bubble in the creek, and then he noticed a turtle sunning itself on a rock. He'd seen other boys use their sticks to hit turtles and other animals. It was part of what the kids thought was fun. Oftentimes, children, and grown-ups too, are copycats, so they mimic the behavior of others who seem bigger and stronger than themselves. Young Theodore wanted to be like the other boys he'd seen, so he raised his stick into the air, taking aim and preparing to knock the turtle into the water. But then something stopped him. Something seemed wrong about that situation. He looked again at the turtle, quiet, peaceful, enjoying the summer day just like he was. Had the turtle ever hurt him? Was the turtle so different than himself? Slowly, he lowered the stick and walked home, thinking about what had happened. When he got home, his mother was there to greet him, and he told her about what happened. She listened very carefully to Theodore, and listened especially carefully when he related how some strange force inside of him had stopped him from hitting the little animal. Theodore, she said, that force inside you was the voice of conscience. Always pay attention to it. Follow what your conscience tells you. It's your moral compass that points you in the right direction. If you honor your conscience, you'll never go wrong in this world. Well, he followed his mother's good advice, and he became a champion of the defenseless who needed defending fighting to end slavery and increase women's rights. He was an inspirational Unitarian minister who felt a sense of kinship with the whole family of creation. And it all started one summer day when he was just a five-year-old, a child who saw a turtle and decided to do what was right. And now join me in singing our children to Children's Chapel. For the meditation, some words about duality. How do you live in the world on a daily basis in a lifestyle that has to deal with both sides of the coin of thinking, positive and negative, both sides of the coin of feeling, pleasure and pain, and both sides of the coin of being, human and divine? That is our new sound for coming out of meditation. <laughs> Trying some new things out, you know, so. 
Let us know what you think. <laughs> I liked it because it kind of had me going, you know. The meditation is so relaxing that sometimes I don't want to stop. I just want to sit there. So that's exactly the kind of sound we need. My reading today is from the Tao Te Ching, number 15. This is uh, Stephen Mitchell's translation, if you're wondering. He's my favorite translator. The ancient masters were profound and subtle. Their wisdom was unfathomable. There is no way to describe it. All we can describe is their appearance. They were careful. Careful as someone crossing an iced over stream. Alert as a warrior in enemy territory. Courteous as a guest. Fluid as melting ice. Shapeable as a block of wood. Receptive as a valley. Clear as a glass of water. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? The master doesn't seek fulfillment, not seeking, not expecting. She is present and can welcome all things. Listen to the wind, though it speaks 
Thank you. Our choir doesn't want to hear the same sermon twice, but I got to listen to them sing twice. <laughs> I'm teasing, of course. They're going away to Mother's Day breakfast. They're going away. They, they can always go. I'm teasing. It doesn't bother me at all. You know that. I wouldn't want to listen to my sermon twice either, truthfully. I watched, what was that? What's that movie out there? Everywhere, everything, all at once. Yeah, I, I went and saw that, and, and it was like so much work. Uh, the whole time I was just so that's kind of what my sermons can be like right so like once is definitely enough good movie but I don't want to see the hot dog fingers again that was once was enough so um, I want to start by talking about it for those who are familiar with the Hebrew scriptures the old it's called the Old Testament often in our culture. Uh, with the, the, at least the mythical beginnings of, of the Hebrew people. According to the story, just three months into their 40-year journey through the wilderness, the Hebrew people received their marching orders, so to speak. That's when the story says that Moses received the Ten Commandments while on the mountain a mountain in the desert of Sinai. The very first command, the starting point of the religion of a people who were also at the very start of their journey, states as follows, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. You shall not make to thyself any graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. You shall not adore them nor serve them. So the very first commandment is a warning against idolatry. The crafting and worship of fabricated images. Given what the story tells us about this entity, what little we know of this entity up to this point, it makes sense that it doesn't want us worshiping objects. As Exodus says, by the day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to guide them by light so that they could travel by day and night. This is really astonishing imagery for a religion. That the God the Hebrews are following is nebulous and ever-changing. That's what clouds are. Nebulous. Always morphing, shapeless things with no clear beginnings or ends. And fire changes so quickly that it became the element Heraclitus chose for his philosophy of constant change. You may recall this shapeless entity first appears to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And later, as proof that it is actually speaking to Moses, it tells him, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking and will always put their trust in you. So we can understand how such a nameless, nebulous, ever-changing entity might not wish to be objectified and would warn those who wish to follow its guidance not to worship the well-defined objects and images crafted by their own hands and minds. This is why the very next commandment, step number two, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The concept of a God is so nebulous that it is considered wrong 
to speak. To speak as if we understand it. And egregious to claim that we know its mind and its will. It's a sin. A violation of one of the Ten Commandments to talk about God. Don't talk about God. It's one of the commands. It's amazing. This is why when Moses first asked for its name, as proof that he's actually spoken to it, the entity says, I am who I am. You tell them that I am has sent you. Now the word for I am in Hebrew really is better translated as I will be whatever I want to be. You tell them, I will be whatever I want to be, sent you. Or sometimes just translate, I'm becoming. I'm becoming, like a cloud, like a flame. Always changing. That's what I, that's what I am, becoming something else. This is a being that refuses to be put in a box to be confined by definition, to be turned into a graven image. And this is a very different idea of God than the one that is at the heart of many religions we're familiar with. This shapeless, changing God that doesn't want to be defined, named, or even spoken of. The opposite of this type of God is idolatry. The erection of false gods constructed by our own hands and minds. Be they constructed images, theological dogmas and creeds, or just the things and beliefs that we craft for ourselves in everyday life, then cling to them as if they are objective truth. For truth in reality is like the entity guiding the Hebrews through the uncertainty of the desert. The truth is nameless, shapeless, changing, with boundaries so soft and shifty that we cannot tell where it begins and where it ends. But when we forget who this command is coming from and obey only its first line, because usually when you ask what's the first commandment, people say, have no other gods before me. Well, no, there's a lot more to it than that. When that's all we pay attention to, then we're actually doing the opposite of the command. We are justifying our idolatrous thinking. The very opposite of the first step necessary for the spiritual journey. The first step necessary for the spiritual journey is to let go of knowing. To let go of certainty. And when we do begin this way, when religion or, or, or life in general are based on idolatry, upon the false certainty that our ideas are right, and therefore our ways are right, and that we know what is true, we know the mind and the will and the word of God, its name, shape, and unchanging ways, then we justify a life in a religion of intolerance and self-righteousness and delusion. It's delusional to think we know the truth, because we don't. There's another story in the Hebrew Scriptures about a man named Micah who was obsessed with silver. So much so that he stole 1,100 shekels from his own mother. And when she discovers his betrayal, Michael returns the silver, which his mother then consecrates to Yahweh, which by the way is not the name of the Hebrew God. It was a, a tetragram, which is four symbols that were put there because it was, it was such taboo to ever say its name. 
that they had just these four dots. And when we translated it, we gave it vowels so that we could have a word. Right? Jehovah or Yahweh, just according to which <laughs> vows you put in. But as, I, as I said earlier, we're, hook, we're hooked on phonics. So we've got to have a word we can actually pronounce. But it's not a word you can pronounce. Yahweh, so that's not the name. Anyway, she consecrates it to this nameless being. By having it actually refined, having this silver refined, believe it or not, into a graven image. She makes an idol out of it. And she gives it to Micah. And Micah worships the idol. Yet she fashions. He makes a shrine for it in his home. And then he hires a priest to oversee this self-constructed religion. He's running out of his house, which pleases him to no end until one day 600 soldiers from another clan are passing through and they take everything. They take the idol. They take the scriptures that Micah had carved into stone. They took the priest's clothes and they even took the priest. He was left with nothing. And upon discovering what happened, Distraught Michael convinces as many of his friends and neighbors as possible to go out in pursuit of these soldiers, hoping that he can retrieve his idol. And when he catches, when he catches up with them, they ask, what's the matter? Michael says, you've taken my gods, which I have made, and the priest, and you've gone away. What more do I have? So how can you even ask me what the matter is? But Micah and his friends are vastly outnumbered, and just as soon as they're threatened with violence, he must return home with nothing. I believe that most, if not all of us, have at times been like Micah. Constructed an idol or two in our hearths, our hearts and our heads, that we worshipped and that we felt compelled to protect enough to do battle over convinced that our holy right to hold on to the subjective opinion that we have objectified as ultimate truth that we have turned that is into an idol these are not always grand idols either they may be no more than the Objectification of a whim, of a momentary feeling, a flight of fancy that we feel compelled to make real by forcing others to acknowledge and accept it. If not, we feel threatened by and angry at them for not agreeing with us. It could be something trivial. We are right. And when we are right, we are therefore righteous. And by not acknowledging the hard and certain reality of our idols, we have been wronged. And they must be forced or manipulated into seeing things our way, which our idolatry deludes us into believing is really God's way, the way, the truth, The story of Micah's idol reminds me of how ready we are to abandon democracy itself to maintain our idols in the way of life that we have centered around them. Donald Trump and those who still deny that he lost the election based entirely upon the idolization of Trump and unsubstantiated claims against the empirical facts, is like Micah and his neighbors running out to do battle with an army. Right? The votes are against them. They're outnumbered. At least Micah finally realizes the reality of his situation and goes home. So Trump and some of his most extreme devotees 
are still in denial that their idol has been removed from their house. In this case, their White House. And he's not coming back. He'll not be returned. I don't know which way to pray on that. But in 2023, I should say 2020, in 23 years of ministry in our liberal religion, I have seen this same phenomenon oft occur in our own communities, which by definition are supposed to be devoted to democratic principles. Still, sometimes one or two individuals, maybe a handful, don't necessarily agree with the outcome of a community's decision or of the decisions the community has authorized individuals like our board of trustees or even your minister to make and they claim the decision is not democratic. Democracy is not perfect. We all know that because there are some who will almost always end up dissatisfied with the outcome, right? That's the nature of democracy. But as Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Sometimes people disagree with us. Sometimes we don't get our way. But just because others don't think, see things our way is not a moral crisis. It's just the way it is. Seven and a half billion people on the world, in the world. Some of them disagree with me. <laughs> I gotta live with that. It's not a big deal. But when enchanted by the things and the truths that we create for ourselves, our tendency is to protect them, or pro project them, I should say, outwardly into the world, as if they are substantive and real. That's why dogmas and creeds are invented. Right? It is the idolization of ideas. That's what idols are. An attempt to make real what exists only in our hearts and our minds. And what should exist only in our hearts and our minds. Their distorted attempts to resolve life's perennial problems. It's questions of truth. The desire for certainty and the avoidance of doubt. The wish to know the difference between good and evil to fully grasp the underlying nature of reality and to know for sure the meaning and purposes of our own lives. These are big questions. They are an attempt to feel certain in an uncertain world. But these perennial problems are like the nebulous entity guiding the, he guiding the Hebrew children through the wilderness. Nameless, shapeless, shifting, indiscernible. They are the journey that we are on. Few, but few can bear living life in such a fog of unknowing. As mystics in the midst of the mystery of our existence. It's more comfortable to delude ourselves and to reinforce our delusions by forcing others to revere our idols just as much as we do. Many of us, like Micah, succumb to such pressure. You remember, Micah started off taking his mother's silver. Perhaps he would have fashioned his own authentic images of the world. But in the end, she makes that idol for him, and he dutifully accepts it, brings it into his home, and makes a religion out of it. How many of our own ideas, how many of the ideas we own. How many of the ideas we think are our own? It's 
How many of them were fashioned for us by somebody else? How many of them were handed down to us from our forebears? One of the most profound statements that I have ever heard is at the beginning of William James' classic book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. Although it was first published in 1902, Varieties is still considered the seminal source for understanding religious experience. So imagine how astonishing it is to read at the very start of this 400-page, 10-point font book without section headings. <laughs> That's how they wrote back then. About religious experience that the only time he will mention the world's major religion, religions is when saying he won't be mentioning them. I speak not now of your ordinary religious believer who follows the conventional observances of his country, whether it be Buddhist, Christian, or Mohammedan. His religion has been made for him by others, communicated to him by tradition, determined to fixed forms by imitation and retained by habit. Fixed forms, just another word for idols which is why James refers to a life based on them as the second-hand religious life. Because it does not represent one's own authentic experience. So in one sweeping sentence, this seminal work about religious experience, James dismisses all the world religions, he says, because it would profit us little to study them. For James, most religions are an idolatrous attempt to turn another person's subjective experience into an objective reality that can be re-experienced by everyone through imitation and habit, be it the religion, the religious experience, the authentic religious experience of a Jesus or a Buddha or a Muhammad. That was their experience. And we want to crystallize it and mass-produce it. But again, I'm not talking strictly about religious beliefs here. I'm talking about how many of us instinctively react to the world in our everyday lives. Here's the process. It begins, like everything else, with stimulus and response. Just as photons caused minute responses from our photosensitive, single-celled ancestors. Any sort of experience causes a response from us, although ours can be very complicated responses because we're more complicated than our single-celled ancestors. This is what Kierkegaard meant when he famously claimed that truth is subjectivity. Not that there isn't an objective truth, or at least what we might call an empirical reality outside of ourselves, outside our heads, but it is not possible for us to fully understand it outside of our own subjective experiences of it. Over the centuries, we've developed a, a few mechanisms for helping our subjective understanding of the world better jive with objective reality, science, logic, empiricism. But even then, whatever you experience is subject to our limited understanding, to our psychological state, and to our emotional and ideological biases. This is why it's better to just let the mystery be, to learn to wander about the wilderness with a mindset of awe and of wonder, walking humbly with our nameless, shapeless, shifting God, than making a hard idol of our own beliefs just so that we can feel safe and secure and certain in a sometimes unsafe, insecure, and always uncertain world. But again, this isn't only about grand religious and philosophical ideas. 
It's about the ordinary tendency to have a subjective experience than to objectify it by making an idol of it through projection, right? Through putting it out into the world as if it's something real or at least something beyond our subjective experiences. And finally, to moralize our opinion. So if you, if you want to remember the process, it's really simple. Despite how complicated I've made it sound. Subjectify, objectify, moralize. Subjectify, objectify, moralize. That's what we do. That's how it works. We have a subjective experience, we objectify it, and then we moralize it. Make an idol of it. The example that I often use to get this point across is two friends who've come out of a movie. Okay? While inside the theater, each has had their own subjective experience of the movie they watched together. Right? They sat in silence, they watched it, it impacted them emotionally, they had thoughts. It was a subjective experience of the movie. Okay? Outside, one says, that was a great movie. And the other says, are you nuts? It was terrible. Hot dog fingers. <laughs> right? And as the conversation continues, their disagreement worsens to the point that they end up angry at each other. And notice that neither begins by describing their subjective responses to the film and leaving it that, right? They don't say, I didn't enjoy it, or I did enjoy it. Instead, they immediately describe their subjective, subjective experience in objective terms. As if the feelings, their feelings, reflect something objectively true about the movie. It was great. It was terrible. Right? We've objectified it. We've had a feeling, a subjective experience. We've it, something intrinsically about this movie was great. Something intrinsically about it is terrible. That is a very simple example of idolatry, of making an idol out of an idea, an emotion, an experience, and it is usual. When we speak of our subjective experiences, our internal responses to external stimuli, we tend to immediately objectify them by speaking as if what we are feeling indicates something empirically true about the world. It's good. It's bad. Instead of, I didn't like it. I didn't care much for it. It didn't do much for me. Or, I, I found it to be very moving. It made me hungry for hot dogs. <laughs> Wish I had a bun. <laughs> right? That movie is terrible. Brussels sprouts are gross. Star Wars is better than Star Trek. When we know it is the other way around. <laughs> I am right. You are wrong. I am righteous. You are a heretic, an infidel, a traitor. Dangerous. And it is this moralization of our projected subjective experiences and beliefs that make idolatry such a negative force in the world. It is the idolaters who make life miserable for the rest of us as they work to codify their subjective feelings by manipulating or forcing others to recognize them as true. And in the age of social media, the ability to make idols out of our lived experience is easier than ever by allowing millions of individuals to share every random thought and personal feeling they have with thousands of people who are actually referred to as their followers. And if you have lots of followers, you're an influencer. In his recent Atlantic article, After Babel, How Social Media Dissolved the Mortar of Society and Made Americans Stupid, how's that for a title? Have you guys heard of this? Yet, 
in, in, in the Atlantic of just, just this month. Yeah, really, go online and read that one, man. It is, it is really good. Uh, it's by so, uh, this social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who probably you have heard of some of his best-selling books. Uh, and anyway, he explains that, that initially these social platforms were, were relatively harmless when they were just a, an advanced extension of our ability to send communications to one another. But gradually, he says, social media users became more comfortable sharing intimate details of their lives with strangers and corporations. Of all things. In other words, millions of us are now willing and able to easily project some of our most personal feelings, beliefs, and experiences outwardly into the world. The more likes and shares they get from others, the more real and therefore true they become for us. The empirical or logical quality of our experiences and opinions isn't even a consideration, only how many others like what we share. That is the new Velveteen Rabbit. What is real? Likes and shares. That's what makes you real. Subjectify, objectify, moralize. This, I believe, is how we go, go about fashioning idols out of our emotions. We have a personal feeling in response to external stimuli, like a movie. We then objectify the feeling by articulating it as external truth. It's a terrible movie. And then we attempt to force our new objective truth, our dogma, onto others by moralizing our opinion. Since you disagree, you can find your own ride home. Since you disagree with me, you are not democratic. Since the results aren't what I wanted, the system is rigged. Since our candidate lost, the election was stolen. It doesn't matter if there's any facts, any empirical evidence, any logic. How, mu how much is it shared? How much is it liked? It must be true. But I'm not giving this sermon really to rebuke election deniers, but to help each of us understand just how quickly and easily and thoughtlessly we can fashion idols out of our own emotional responses to the world, to mistake them as truth, and then to make the lives of others miserable by forcing or manipulating them to accept an objective truth, as objective truth, what is merely our own subjective emotional responses to the world around us. In the process, we also delude ourselves. Living an inauthentic life, be it a second-hand religious life, revering idols fashioned for us by others, or simply because we would rather deceive ourselves than to face life on its own terms. We would rather be comfortable than uncertain. And worst of all, in choosing an idolatrous life, a life of deception, of self-deception, we miss out on the best part of experience itself. It's mystery. It's awe and it's wonder. It's novelty. It's mountaintop experiences, the wonderment of wandering through the wilderness, its wildness, and its mouth-dropping astonishments that occur only when we let go of our need to feel certain and to be in control. Think about it. When were all the, the best, most moving, transformative experiences for you? When you were in control? The joy of letting go. The calm of letting be. The relief of letting others. The pleasure of letting them enjoy it their way. The love, the kindness, the peace. 
These are the emotions I most enjoy. Emotions that I cannot idolize, I cannot cling to, I cannot grasp, I cannot control, I cannot force, I cannot conjure. But I know where I am most apt to find them. Out there in the mist, in the mystery, in the great cloud of unknowing beckoning us to follow it and let it guide us through the wilderness of life. Look, and it can't be seen. Listen, and it can't be heard. Reach, and it can't be grasped. This is the beginning of all wisdom. Thank you. Well, we're going to sing a favorite of mine, at least. <laughs> um, uh, please rise as you're willing and able to sing I Can See Clearly Now, Johnny Nash, Words and Music. benediction, the words of Carl Sagan. Every one of us is, in the cosmic perspective, precious. If a human disagrees with you, let him live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. Amen. Blessed be. <laughs> Salam alaikum and shalom.